mute all current and new participants, yes. Record on this computer. Shalom Erev Tov and good evening from Jerusalem, Israel. This is Lowell Joseph Gallen, founder of the Root and Branch Association, which was established in 1981 in New York State. I would like to welcome our viewers and listeners worldwide and our live studio Zoom audience to this evening's program in our Root and Branch Association Limited English Language Conference and Lecture Series broadcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. And now celebrating our first quarter century, first 25 years from January 1995 until 2020 today. Today is Monday, excuse me, October 19th, 2020 in the Gregorian calendar. And the second day of Cheshvan 5781 in the Israelite Hebrew calendar. We are now in the sixth year of our seven year sabbatical Shemitah year cycle. We are broadcasting from the land of Israel, city of God, Jerusalem, Hill of the Priests, Gibat Hanania, Abu Tur, overlooking Mount Moriah, where the third and final Israelite Temple of Jerusalem will soon be under reconstruction and stand forever as per the prophet Ezekiel's vision. Please see Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. The Root and Branch Association promotes the study and practice of universal Israelite Jewish teachings within the framework of the universal Noahide covenant and laws. Please see Genesis chapter nine. And affirmation of God's land, Torah, and people covenants with his chosen people, Israel. Our speaker for this evening's program is a very old dear friend of many decades, Professor Richard Schwartz. And he will speak on his new book, which is called Vegan Revolution, Saving Our World, Revitalizing Judaism. Now, I would like to welcome our program chair, Dr. Les Glassman, who will introduce Professor Schwartz. Well, thank you so much, Lowell, and uh, it's good to see that you well, and just wishing you a total refuel shlema. Anyway, it's a great honor and a privilege to introduce um, Professor Richard Schwartz. Um, Richard, I'm just going to mention a little bit about you before you give your fascinating talk, which we all eagerly await. So Richard A. Schwartz, the author of the recently published book, Vegan Revolution, Saving the World, Revitalizing Judaism, and other books, and there are quite a few, and they're all absolutely amazing and highly recommendable. The others are Judaism and Vegetar Vegetarianism, Judaism and Global Survival, who Stole My Religion, Revitalizing Judaism and Applying Jewish Values to Help Heal Our Imperiled Planet, and Mathematics and Global Survival. And Richard, you are a pro prolific writer, and you have over 250 articles at the jewishveg.com slash Schwartz um, website. You are the president um, emeritus of uh, the Jewish Veg, formerly known as the Jewish Vegetarians, North America, and President of the Society of Ethical and Religious Vegetarians. In 1987, you were elected, you were selected as the Jewish Vegetarian of the Year by the Jewish Vegetarians of North America. That's an amazing achievement. And in 2005, you were inaugurated into the North American Vegetarian Society Hall of Fame. Also a, a phenomenal achievement. Um, you're an uh, associate producer of the award-winning documentary, A Sacred Duty, Applying Jewish Values to Help Save the World. You are a patron of the International Jewish Vegetarian Society. And now your, your latest book, which um, we eagerly await you to tell us a little bit more about, is um, Vegetarian Revolution, Saving the World and Revitalizing Judaism. Without any further ado, I want to introduce our guest speaker, 
Professor Richard Schwartz. So Richard, if you can uh, unmute and... Okay. Okay, once again, thank you for the very kind introduction. And before starting, I just want to salute Lowell Gowan for the 25 years. It's been such a pleasure working with him. I've given many talks at the Israel Center and his auspices, and uh, uh, just wish there were many more like him, so many wonderful programs, uh, my talks, and uh, so many other very important people giving talks over there. Okay, so. Uh, the book just published actually uh, a few weeks ago, as you say, Vegetarian Revolution, Saving the World, Vitalizing Judaism. And I'll indicate just some of the key points in the book and then try to uh, discuss them, explain them in more detail. So one of the key points is very, very unfortunate that the world is heading toward a climate catastrophe. And the second important point is, that's why it's called Vegan Revolution, that a shift toward veganism is an essential part of what's necessary. Many things have to be done. And many people are aware, you know, we have to be more efficient in energy. We have to get more efficient cars, for example. And, uh, you know, you, you better mass transit, many things. But I want to stress the shift to veganism, very important. And the third very important thing is that Judaism, thank God, has wonderful teachings on uh, compassion, on the environment, health, and all. So I want to get into all of those. <clears throat> so I want to reinforce, first of all, that the world is heading toward a climate catastrophe. And I wish I could say that's just my opinion. Who is this nut that believes that? But there's an unbelievably strong consensus of uh, scientists about that. They uh, indicate 97% of climate scientists uh, believe that the, that the world's heading toward a catastrophe, that human activities are a major part of that, and much has to be done. And even stronger than that is every major science academy agrees. So there you have like a consensus when you have a science academy. And even more important than that is that the thousands of peer-reviewed articles in respected science journals also agree with that conclusion. I can have an opinion, you can have an opinion, but a peer-reviewed article means it's been reviewed maybe by four or five experts. Doesn't mean that every single peer-reviewed article will be correct. When you have thousands of them, then you have a consensus that uh, something is happening. And to reinforce that, perhaps the most important organization related to climate is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, intergovernmental the top climate experts from many of the countries of the world. And what they have stated, every four or five years they make a report, and each one they have more and more dire warnings. But October 2018, they indicated that quote unquote, unprecedented changes need to be made by the year 2020, only 10 years from now, in order to avert this climate catastrophe, okay? And another indication of this is that in December 2015, in Paris at a climate conference, 195 nations, just about all of the nations in the world, all agreed. When you think of all the disputes in the world, you know, the famous saying, you have two Jews, you have three opinions. We know here in Israel, we had three elections. God forbid we have a fourth, there's so much division. The US, of course, is having a big vote, the Democrats, Republicans, so far apart disagreeing about everything. So here, amazing, 195 nations all agreed, of course, all based on the recommendations of the scientists, again, that climate change is a major, major problem. And by the way, most of those 195 nations made pledges of reducing their gas housing, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by a certain, a certain percent by 2020, 25, 2030, whatever it would be. And the very frightening thing is that those pledges, which are then unbinding, many nations are behind in uh, trying to keep up with it. But even if all were kept, the temperature since pre-industrial times has gone up by about 1.1 degrees Celsius, about two degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, 1.1 degrees Celsius. Now, even if every pledge is kept, according to the climate experts, it's going to go up not by 1.1, which it is now, by three, 
degrees Celsius, a tripling. And when you realize all the environmental and the climate, severe climate effects at 1.1 degrees Celsius, you can imagine how terrible it would be at three degrees Celsius. Okay, now it's not just the scientific experts, but it's facts on the ground that are reinforcing this view about heading toward climate catastrophe. For example, the temperature has gone up, by the way, as you mentioned here in Israel, last month was the warmest September in Israel's history. Okay, so the reality is every decade since the 1970s has been hotter than the previous decade. And this is like an amazing thing. All the 20 years in this century, all 20 years are in the top 21 hottest years there's been. By the way, uh, temperature record was broken in 2014 and then successively in 2015, 2016. Three years in a row, temperature records worldwide average temperature broken. This year, 2020 is on track to possibly be the hottest. If not, it will be in the top two or three. So temperatures definitely have been getting hotter. And just as a human being who has a fever, a high temperature has side effects, you know, coughing, sore throat, uh, diarrhea, headaches. The same is true for the world. Higher temperature, very negative effects we're seeing. For example, there's rapid melting now of glaciers all over the world, polar ice caps, and so-called permafrost. Permafrost means like but they thought permanent, permanent, uh, the icing over the gases underneath, methane, etc. But things are warming up so much that the permafrost is melting, and that's going to release greenhouse gases, including methane. We'll talk about it a little bit later, a very potent greenhouse gas. And of course, with all that melting, that is raising the waters all over. So far, it's only eight inches that it's gone up, but even with that eight inches, that is enough to cause what's called sunny day flooding in cities like Miami Beach, Florida, coastal cities. So we have the negative effects, things melting. By the way, the gl glaciers melting is extremely serious because the glaciers is like God's plan in a way that they freeze up in the winter, melt in the spring, water going down into the springs and the rivers, etc providing irrigation water for the farmers and also as that melts uh, at the beginning, there's more water because it's melting, but as there's less and less, that can be a big problem for agriculture in the future. Now, in addition, there's been an increase, because the temperature's going up, there's an increase in heat waves and there's an, there's been an increase in severe uh, droughts, wildfires, storms, and floods. So much so that, for example, in California, they had first it got hot, which caused the uh, drying up, so the kind uh, of drought, and then wildfires, and then when the rain came, they were heavy, heavy storms. So much so that the former governor of California, Jerry Brown, said that humanity is on a collision course with nature. Okay, so many, many, some have said this is going to be called the century of drought. We'll drought in many, many different areas. Of course, Israel had five or six years of drought. The last two winters have been very fortunate. We had very heavy rain. The Galilee reached very high levels. But the uh, predictions are for Israel to become hotter and drier. It's not going to be every single year. There will be some rainy years, but overall, that is what uh, will be happening. Okay, and by the way, of course, we've always had droughts, we've always had storms in order. Sometimes they, in the past, they said this is a hundred year storm, something once in a hundred years occurring very, very often. Now, everybody has probably seen pictures of the tremendous wildfires out in California. Uh, really hit over and over again. And it's so severe that the smoke has made the air quality worse than that in cities like Shanghai, Beijing, and China, and other cities that are known to be severely polluted. 
So that is uh, one of the things that's been happening. And at the same time, we've had tremendous storms hitting the Gulf Coast, Louisiana, things like Louisiana in the U.S. Again, there's always been storms. This year has been especially a great number of storms, hurricanes, etc. So much so that they went through the entire U.S. alphabet. You know, they named storms like Sally was one of the major storms that hit Louisiana. They went all the way from A to Z. Last night, saw about a week ago, up to Delta, the fourth letter in the Greek alphabet, and the hurricane season is far, far from over. And just once before, in 2005, when we had the major hurricane Sandy, it went up to the sixth letter, but chances are that will be exceeded. So, uh, again, an increase, heat waves, the melting, glaciers, etc., more and more of droughts, wildfires, severe storms, flooding. So, major problem. But the outlook for the future in many ways is far, far worse. As I mentioned, 1.1 degrees Celsius so far, three degrees at least, and it could go way beyond that. And another factor is that just like um, a cardiologist will tell you there's a threshold for cholesterol above which you're in danger for a heart problem. It doesn't mean you're going to have it, but it's more of a danger. Same thing is true for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The experts believe that about 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide is like a threshold. And um, beginning of the industrial age, it was about 285 parts per million. Now it has passed 415. 350, you're in, above, you're in a danger zone, 415. Instead of decreasing, it's been on the increase. So that is a problem. Another thing is, by the way, for those who sometimes have doubts, they say, well, um, maybe the scientists are wrong. There's a couple of factors. One thing is that the insurance industry, certainly not radicals, they are super concerned because they've been losing a fortune in money. I mentioned all the flooding, all the climate events in California. Sometimes the amount that they're asking for home insurance went up from $1,800 to $9,000. So that's, but even more important perhaps is the US military. They are super concerned about climate change because they feel that uh, in the hotter, drier world, more and more floods in the world, there's going to be tens of millions, possibly hundreds of millions, desperate, hungry, thirsty refugees fleeing from these climate, climate events. So that, is, matter of fact, that's already happened. There's been civil wars in both um, Su the Sudan and in Syria. In both cases, five or six years, very severe drought, the farms failed, and therefore the farmers moved into the cities and ready to see so overcrowded and uh, uh, it's very desperate and there's always uh, people willing to take advantage of those kinds of situations. So uh, that could be far, far more if we continue to have a hotter, drier world. By the way, Israel, unfortunately, is threatened probably even more than other countries. The climate experts indicate the Middle East is warming up, drying up even faster than other areas. And as I mentioned, when uh, uh, there's more droughts and severe storms, more refugees, so the chances for terrorism and war are increased because of that. Matter of fact, the sages saw that the words lechem and milchama came from the same root. They indicated when there's a shortage of resources, people are more likely to go to war due to climate change there could be a reduction in productivity of food. As areas are flooded, of course, the capacity to grow food will be changing. So we have all of that thing. Now, one other extremely important thing is a concept known as uh, self-reinforcing positive feedback loops. In short, um, vicious cycles. That is one thing that makes the future much worse. A lot of people say, well, maybe tomorrow things will change and get better. Hopefully, there's a possibility. And we have moved to improving and moving 
from uh, coal and oil to solar and wind power, some positive. But the self-reinforcing positive feedback loop, something like a domino effect. We all know you can have a million dominoes one after the other, just push one, one tiny push, you can have a million dominoes all falling down. So this uh, vicious cycle is a little different. It's like event A increases event B, which increases A and back and forth. And just to give one or more examples, when the sun's rays hit the ice in the frozen north, 70% of the sun's, sun's rays are reflected back out into space. Ice and snow are very good reflectors. But eventually some of that ice and snow is going to melt and then the sun's rays hit the much warmer soil or water that was under the ice. Instead of 70% being reflected back, only about 6% is reflected back. 94% is absorbed, which means more and more melting and more melting exposes more dark land, so more heated uh, sun's rays are absorbed. And of course, another example of that is, we mentioned the burning of the trees in California and other areas, by the way, even in Israel not too long ago, they had a lot of fires in the north because here too, so far we haven't had any rain, the rainy season hopefully is starting soon. And when things are dry, extensive fires, you know, Okay, so because of those fires, it makes future climate events and fires more likely. Because, as we all know, trees absorb carbon, give off oxygen. So when you destroy so many trees, the potential for absorbing that carbon dioxide is lost and more is in the atmosphere, and that causes that so how greenhouse effect. Just like in the winter, it can be very cold, but if you have so-called uh, greenhouse, the sun's rays penetrate, warm up the plants inside, and then at a different wavelength, they are trapped inside. Less of it uh, that, that came in goes out. Okay, so also as the trees burn, that stored carbon dioxide is released in the atmosphere, so there too, a positive feedback loop. Another quick example is, of course, when things get hotter, people are more likely to use air conditioning which means more fossil fuels burned, and which means uh, more heating up, which means getting hotter to when you try to use more air conditioning. So we have uh, a major, major problem uh, with that happening, and economists actually feel there could be a tipping point. You know, it's not a linear event, These example, if a person is gaining weight, they may say, you know, if I hit this weight, I go on a tremendous diet and hopefully they can drop. But in, in the case of climate, the temperature and the climate conditions hit a point where again, like the domino effect, it, it, uh, it can, the tipping point could spin out of control. Okay, so this has to be the number one issue and everything possible has to be done to avert that climate change. Okay, so I mentioned in terms of my book, Saving the World and Revitalizing Judaism. And the second point I mentioned before was that a shift to veganism is essential part. Other things have to be done. As I see Larry Pfeffer's there, he'll tell you, and it's 100% right, we have to come up with better farming ways, better ways of raising rice, which is another factor that increases greenhouse gas emissions, but many people are not aware that animal-based agriculture is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. There's now about 7.8 billion people in the world, but about 60 billion farmed animals slaughtered every single year. And one of the things, especially from cows, is that they emit methane, a very potent greenhouse gas, due to their digestive and excretion processes. And methane is far more potent than carbon dioxide. It's only in the atmosphere like 20 years, but it's about 84 times as potent per molecule as carbon dioxide. And therefore, as I say, the agriculture industry is a major contributor. So much so that there was a report in 2006 by the UN Food and Agricultural Organization 
It wasn't an animal rights group. It wasn't an environmental group or the Sierra Club, for example. The UN Food and Agricultural Organization did a study. They found that the animal-based agriculture emits more greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide equivalents than all the cars, planes, trains, all the means of production worldwide combined. And you realize how many cars there are in the world, how many traffic jams in the normal condition, how many planes normally taking off when we don't have the coronavirus pandemic, all the time, you can see how serious that is. And also in 2009, it was a cover story in the World Watch magazine by two environmentalists uh, connected to the World Bank. Again, World Bank, certainly not a radical group, not an animal rights group, not an environmental group. And they took many things into account. For, like for example, tropical rainforest being cut down, sometimes burned purposely in order to provide grazing land, pasture land, and land to grow feed crops for animals. So because of all that, they claim that human-induced greenhouse gas emissions, uh, animal-based diets are responsible for 51% of that. Other studies have found lower numbers, but it's definitely a significant amount. So veganism, the shift to veganism is essential. Now, I also try to point out in the book that veganism is really the diet most uh, close to Jewish values. So to give a quick example, I have six mandates that point to vegetarianism, even more so veganism as the ideal diet. And I'll just mention them and then briefly discuss them or want to leave some time for questions. Okay, six mandates. One is to take care of our health. Second, to treat animals with compassion. Third, to uh, be co-workers with God, protect the environment. Fourth, to conserve natural resources. Fifth, to help hungry people. And six, to seek and pursue peace. Okay, very briefly, uh, I regard taking care of our health as arguably the most important mitzvah. Now, as you know, there's 613 mitzvot, but only one of them has the word ma'od very much in it. That's finish martem, the old, the nafsho tekem. The only one that has the word ma'od, we very diligently guard our souls, and the sages interpret that as to diligently guard our health. And another thing, 613 mitzvot, 610 of them, can be overridden if it's a matter of pakuach nefesh, if a life is in danger. The only three that cannot be overridden, the three so-called cardinal sins, murder, idolatry, and uh, sexual immorality. Okay, so, and uh, animal-based diets, many studies have shown very negative effects. That ties in, by the way, with Something we just read on Shabbat in the synagogue, the beginning of rereading of the Torah, you know, in the cycle, starting in with Bereshit. And in the very first chapter, chapter 1, verse 29, God's first dietary regimen talks about the herbs of the field and the fruits from the trees, strictly vegan diet. And that kept the people very healthy for many years. Later on, permission was reluctantly given after Noah's time with the flood. But uh, initially, we were created as herbivorous animals. And that is similar to the fact that if you look at our hands, we don't have the claws of a uh, carnivorous or, or omnivorous animal. And we don't have the sharp, long, big, like teeth of a carnivorous animal. Our stomach acids are only are 20, uh, I'm sorry, 1 20th as strong as that of a carnivorous animal. And our digestive system is four times longer per unit height as that of a carnivorous animal. So one of the big problems of the world is that we are very close to herbivorous animals, but most people have an omnivorous diet, some plants, but a lot of meat, chicken, fish, eggs, dairy products. And that's why there's an epidemic of disease now in the Jewish community and other communities. Okay, so briefly, 
And then, you know, you can almost say Gaienu after that, because that alone should be enough to convince people to be vegans. But there's far more, as I said, far more mandates. One is compassion for animals, very strong teachings that we have on, on that. And, uh, for example, every day in the synagogue, it says, Baruch Rahim al Ha'ares, Baruch Rahim al Habriot. God's compassion is over the earth and all the creatures. We, as humans, ought to be Rachmanim b'nei Rachmanim, imitating a God whose passion, your compassion is over his works, as it indicates in Psalms 145, number nine. Okay, and of course, many, many teaching, they say Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest Jewish leader, was chosen because as a shepherd, he showed compassion for animals. The same Midrash rabbinic teaching says King David also showed compassion as a shepherd was deemed worthy to lead the Jewish people. And of course, many teachings in the Torah, so important as part of the Ten Commandments, not only are we as humans to rest in the Shabbat, but animals as well. And if a person has an animal or pet, say, as a Jew, we must make sure that that animal has been fed before sitting down to our own meal. And again, summarized by the beautiful great Saab al Chayim. Okay, now again, Judaism has important teachings on the environment. And uh, there are two verses very briefly in the first chapter of Gracie to Genesis that are misinterpreted. Since there, human beings have dominion but the sages interpret that as respectful guardianship or stewardship. Certainly not a blank check. Also, because humans are uniquely created, but so keen in God's image. And that can be interpreted as we're created, but so keen, we should imitate God's attributes of compassion and justice and mercy, for example. Okay. And, um, very important also a reinforcement of the idea that dominion means responsible stewardship is chapter 2 verse 15 where it says that the human being was put in the garden eight in the garden of eden to work the land but also to guard it so we have to be shomri adama guardians of the earth working co-partners with god and protecting the environment and uh, i mentioned before the billions of animals in the world causing many environmental problems, the waste products going into the waters, overgrazing, for example. Also the fact that so much water is used, it takes 13 times as much water for a person on an animal-based diet than for a person on a plant-based diet. And Newsweek many years ago indicated the amount of water needed to raise one cow to maturity ready to be slaughtered, that amount of water could float and naval destroy it. So many problems on that. Okay, so the environment, we mentioned, of course, the climate change aspects. So we have the important Jewish teachings on one hand, and every case, the realities are far from that. Okay, then another important Jewish teaching, Baal Tashkit, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, that says, that even in warfare, you are not to destroy fruit bearing trees to build a battering ram to try to overcome an enemy fortification. Very specific thing, you can't use an ax and trees in wartime. And to me, one of the greatest thing our sages did, because we know Judaism was not just the Torah, but the commentary, the Gemara, the Talmud, Mishnah, etc. So the sages took that very specific law using an axe, wartime, destroying trees. And they made a general prohibition called Baal Tashchit, thou shalt not destroy, you shall not waste. And what a difference that would make if the world took that seriously. We have a world so wasteful where it's like buy, use, discard, and their garbage dumps are building up, and et cetera. Okay, so um, it's very wasteful. I mentioned just a few minutes ago, the huge amounts of water necessary to grow the feed crops to feed the animals also requires far more energy. Think of a world where people go to a tree and pick an apple, an orange, a mango, etc., or carrots or potatoes from the ground, and uh, 
how much less energy you'd need, how much less that would be, or the animal scented diets uh, you need, or that irrigation water, you need so much rain to feed them because they want to fatten them up as soon as possible to make the maximum amount of profit. Okay, so those are again four mandates, take care of our health, feed animals with compassion, protect the environment, conserve the resources. Now I mentioned the fifth mandate is to help the hungry. And not too long ago, two or three weeks ago, we had Yom Kippur. And on that day, where people are fasting, think uh, God can possibly not want more of them. But we have the very powerful quotation of Yeshayahu Isaiah in the morning services of Yom Kippur, where he indicates what is the true purpose of fasting, among other things, to try to end oppression and to share your bread with the hungry. In the Big Hot Hamazon, the blessings after eating, we indicated that God and his compassion has provided enough for everyone. And of course, he really has, but it's super wasteful. 70% of the grain produced in the U.S. is fed to animals destined for slaughter. And 30 or 40% perhaps worldwide. And so it's a scandal that there's so much hunger, so much starvation. There's enough food God has provided, but instead of feeding the people, it's fed to the animals. That increases demand, makes the price go high, higher, and many of the poor people have trouble uh, meeting that expense. Now, what makes this even more shameful, feeding 70% of the grain to animals while so many are being slaughtered, is we take very healthy foods like soy and oats and corn high in fiber, high in complex carbohydrates, and we feed them to animals, uh, and we get meat coming out and other animal products, just the opposite. They are devoid of fiber, devoid of complex carbohydrates, and very high in saturated fat and cholesterol. And uh, that is, again, uh, contributing to the epidemic of disease in the Jewish community and in other communities. Okay, so, and the final mandate is, as they say, vacation uh, alone, seek peace and pursue it. A very important mandate, not just uh, to say where you are, but to pursue peace. Very, very important. Of course, Judaism is not a pacifistic religion, but we have that prophetic dream that the nation should beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. And I mentioned before, the sages indicating lechem and milchama, the words for bread and war coming from the same root, indicating that uh, when there's a shortage of grain and other resources, people are more likely to go to war. And the fact that climate change makes terrorism and more and more likely, well, of course, there's going to be tens, if not hundreds of millions of desperate refugees fleeing from uh, severe climate events. By the way, this has made me come up with a slogan for the peace movement as well as the vegan movement. If you pardon a bit of a pun, it's uh, all we're saying is give peace a chance. Slogan for the peace movement, environmental movement. Okay. By the way, let's see how much time I've been uh, speaking here. Okay, so much, much more, but I wanted to just summarize heading toward a climate catastrophe, heading toward water shortages, perhaps energy shortages, uh, all kinds of terrorism and violence unless things change. Thankfully, Judaism has these powerful, powerful teachings, and uh, it's urgent that this be on the agenda, that averting a climate catastrophe become like a central organizing principle for society today. Uh, because if we don't, we're not going to have a decent world to leave for our children and grandchildren, future generations. So I want to appeal to everybody who will see this, because I know this is going to be put on uh, YouTube and uh, using social media, so hopefully many will see it, that involve become a priority. If you want to, the most important thing you can do for if you have children, grandchildren, if you great-grandchildren, for future generations, and by the way, I've been blessed living in Israel for just four years. I've had three grandchildren get married. 
became a grandfather, great grandfather for the first time. So this gives me added incentive. So I want to urge everybody to get involved. Uh, if you want to learn more, or maybe offer to help, my email address is veggierich at gmail.com. That's V E G G I E R I C H at gmail.com. And as uh, Les was kind enough to mention at the start, I have for 250 articles and the full text of two of my books, including Judaism and Vegetarianism, at uh, www Jewish Veg, one word, Jewish B E G dot org, O R G, slash and F C H W A R T Z. So I'm hoping that people get involved and uh, work for a better world. So I'll be happy to take any comments, questions that people may have and uh, feel free to disagree because that makes for an even more interesting program. Thanks for the opportunity. Once again, I want to salute Lil Gowan and I wish you 25 more and even more years. I may have asked Reem until 120, the traditional saying in Judaism. And uh, Ko Hakabo, kudos, great honor to you and keep it up. You're doing great work. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, Prof, really, there was a very inspiring talk that you gave. And I also want to second, I also want to thank Lowell uh, Gallen for uh, his tremendous work and effort in uh, the root and branch. And we just wish you all to be healthy and well and a total full refresh name. Amen. So uh, we'll open up for questions. If anybody wants to ask anything, I think you explained it very, very well. Uh, I just want to make a, just a brief comment that um, Ralph Cook, the very famous and very beloved um, chief rabbi of Israel, uh, in those days was under the British mandate. Uh, he was a vegetarian and many of the great Rabbonim were vegetarians. So um, you, you're in good company. <laughs> in a very good company. Ralph Cook, as you say, first chief rabbi of pre-state Israel, one of the great Jewish philosophers, one of the great general philosophers, he felt the messianic time would be vegetarian or vegan, and he based it on the powerful teaching of Yeshayahu Isaiah, that in that ideal time, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the lion will be the ash, no one shall hurt nor destroy in all of God's holy mountain. Now it turned out that, again, Rob Cook was a very strong proponent of vegetarianism. Uh, he died in 1935, before we knew so much now about negative health effects and how much uh, grain was fed to animals. So, uh, you know, he was way ahead of his time. But again, he felt for the messianic time. Because of that, he said he had a symbolic little piece of chicken every Shabbat as a reminder that the messianic period was not yet here, mm -hmm. as if we need a reminder in this world with all the violence and oppression and everything. And uh, some people, use Rob Cook against vegetarianism in the fact that he said uh, it's for the messianic period and uh, maybe because so early he uh, indicated uh, that people may not be ready for it at the time and all that. Anyway, I have a co-authored article sort of responding to all of that and uh, uh, the, the Nazir of Jerusalem, David Cohen, yeah. put a lot of vegetarian writings together in something called a vision of vegetarianism and peace, that uh, is strong advocacy. And again, many rabbis today uh, vegetarian. By the way, the president of Israel movement, movement, Rivlin is vegetarian. The chief of staff, Aviv Kohavi, is a vegan. I understand Bibi Netanyahu observes uh, Meatless Monday. And Israel is a world capital for veganism. It has a higher percent of vegans than any other country. And one very important factor is, just like Passover today, it's much easier to celebrate in terms of eating. Maybe 30 or 40 years ago, people were kind of limited in what you could eat. Now there's so many more choices. The same thing with veganism. There are so many plant-based uh, meat substitutes and the, the improving so much the texture and taste in many cases are such that
that people who have eaten meat for years and years, plenty of meat, can't tell the difference between a plant-based burger and an actual animal-based hamburger. So things are changing, the momentum is growing, and thank God, especially the young people, they're seeing what the world is like and they're very concerned uh, about compassion for animals. Again, Judaism has strong, strong teachings about compassion for animals. So the trend is in increasing, especially among the young people. That's our future. Any other questions or comments? I'd be happy to try to respond. Could I add another comment, Prof? So um, years ago, I was in London, and we have uh, non-Jewish friends. And um, obviously, they see me with a kippah, and they know that I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish, and I try to be observant. So they said to me, you know, the, the laws of Kashrut, it's uh, so outdated and uh, we're having a, a very friendly, open discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one lady was, who's a very good friend of ours, actually, was uh, a vegan. And she was eating a, um, it was like a, a cookie from uh, a well-named brand cookie. I don't want to mention the name of the brand, but it was a very well-named brand cookie. Uh, and... Um, I said to you, you know, can I just look at the wrapper of your cookie? And this was in England. And I looked at the wrapper. And on the wrapper, it said it had gelatine. Um, I'm sorry, you, right? It had gelatine. Gelatine oh. was one of the ingredients. Uh, said, Do you know that you are eating gelatine, which is made from pig's hooves? It's, a, it's an animal derivative. And she just, she threw it out. She couldn't uh, believe what I was telling her. Uh, and when you have like the kashrut label saying that this is parav or this is mulchik or, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of non-Jews have actually, um, I've had patients who have told me that it changed their lives when they saw on the label that it was parav, that they knew that there was no milk products inside as well. Because many things, you can get creamers, non-dairy creamers, but it actually has milk in it, milk derivatives. Right. So, uh, the cash <laughs> it really is, uh, you know, it, it, it's so, it's not outdated, it's very indated, and it, it really shows, you know, um, people follow these guidelines. And just as you said, there are many products here in Israel that you can taste that are vegetarian, and they taste incredible, they taste better than meat. And we have such a selection. So, today, it's actually not as difficult as might have been many years ago to be a vegetarian in many vegetarian restaurants. Um, Israel is, I think, at the forefront, one of the main leaders in... Absolutely. Right, right. By the way, there's a wonderful group here called uh, Vegan Friendly. And if you go to the uh, supermarket, the health food store, on many products, you'll see a little symbol that says Vegan Friendly. So yeah. that, uh, that helps. Of course, parva, of course, could have eggs. Eggs are parva, not or milk, so that is very, very helpful to have that. And um, the way I gave you a thought, Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, Chief Rabbi in Efrat, many years ago said, the Kashrut laws are designed to keep, teach us compassion and lead us gently to vegetarianism. So that, uh, of course, should be based on compassion for animals. Unfortunately, some meat products are considered kosher. I guess they are strictly speaking, they meet certain laws, but the way the animals are treated is far, far from the ideal. And of course, the laws of Shekita, Jewish ritual slaughter laws, are designed to minimize the pain. Absolutely. But you can't forget before they get to that point perhaps months at factory farms where they're treated extremely, extremely cruelly and all. And also the fact that things are so mass produced, so rapid and all, that the laws of Shekhita are again designed to minimize cruelty, sometimes cannot be fully observed because things are so fast. It used to be a shokhead or a slaughterer would make a blessing before slaughtering any chicken. Now they whiz by so fast that a blessing has to be said for many, many of them. By the way, another important reason to be a vegan is it makes it much easier to be kosher. Unfortunately, there's been a number of scandals 
yeah. in the food the meat industry. You know, the, when you, a lot of money's involved, and uh, I'm sure most of the inspectors are honest and all, but maybe even if a few percent aren't, no guarantee. And also, if a person has usually have two separate sinks, one for places for meat products, one for dairy. But you know, if you're having three meals a day, 365 days a year on the English calendar, over and over, meat, milk, there's a chance for mistakes and all. So it's much more likely to really strictly keep kosher, not to mention that it's uh, simpler it's cheap. You don't need the four sets of dishes. Uh, milk is places and also special ones for Passover use. So uh, that's another reason for being vegan besides the six mandates that I mentioned. And also, I think a very byproduct of that is that, uh, health-wise. It's, it's actually very healthy. Oh, absolutely. It, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely it goes without saying. Oh, it's by the way, there are studies even that show that heart disease can be reversed on a plant-based diet and even type 2 diabetes. And I just saw a program the other day pointing out the health effects. And one of the things it mentioned, the uh, narrator, the person producing it, was wondering why, if you go to the website of the Heart Association, the Diabetes Association, Cancer Society, they have on their websites recommended food very often. There are animal products, the very foods that are causing the problems. And we went to try to interview them to find out why they're doing that. They sort of ducked the question or they wouldn't interview them. And he found out one of the reasons is that some of the sponsors, people spending millions of dollars, are industries like Tyson's, the, the meat, the egg, the dairy industry, of providing money to these groups. So instead of coming out strongly and pointing out how people can reduce their risks quite a bit by shifting to well-balanced, healthy, nutritious, plant-based diets to doing the opposite. Once again, Gan Eden, Yemot HaMashiach, the ideal time, the Garden of Eden, and the uh, Messianic time, vegetarian. There's another thing we know when the Israelites left Egypt, they were provided with uh, manna, the, the manna, manna from heaven, and that kept them in good health for the 40 years in the desert. But they cried out at one point, uh, you know, people, the grass is always greener on the other side. They wanted flesh. God provided it in the form of quail that blew in from the wind from the sea. And according to the Torah in the book of Numbers, while they were chewing on it, a great plague broke out. Many people died. The place where that occurred was named Kibrot Atava, or the graves of lust, indicating that uh, the, the Torah gives reluctant permission to eat meat, but it equates it with, uh, with lust, uh, very harmful desire. So that is another, according to Isaac Arama, the commentator, he felt this was God's uh, third attempt, or actually a second attempt, if we got Aiden for a plant based diet, but people just weren't ready for it at that time. Hopefully, we're moving toward that period now. Wow. Well, you've given us a lot of food for thought. <laughs> and I just want to mention as well, you know, I once, it was in America that I saw bacon flavored chips. They were actually pyro. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, like you said with the man, when the man fell down, you could choose whatever you wanted to eat, whatever flavor you wanted. Today, you can actually get bacon flavored crisps yes. or that are actually pyro, and it's not meat derived. That's what we wait. You also have, instead of milk from the cow, you have almond milk, soy milk, rice mm -hmm. milk, coconut yeah. milk. So, you have many happy alternatives. And of course, it from the animal that was designed to raise a little baby calf to a very heavy amount of relatively short time. And um, I didn't get into so much more. The way that the dairy cows are mistreated, 
That's what made me shift from first being a vegetarian to a vegan and giving up eggs and milk as well. The dairy cows are artificially impregnated every single year, so they'll constantly be able to give milk. The babies are taken away almost right away in a very cruel process. And uh, there's moaning from the mother and from the baby because the people want that milk to make profit from and not from the calf to have it. Same thing in the egg industry. At the egg laying hatcheries in the U.S., about 250 chicks are killed almost immediately after oh, yeah. birth. Because those are the male chicks and of course they can't lay eggs. And unlike the so-called broilers, they haven't been genetically programmed to have a lot of flesh. So it's not economically uh, profitable. Right. So that immediately chicks are killed very often they're just stuffed in a plastic bag where they crush each other or suffocate. And then the females are kept in battery cages, one on top of the other. And as they go older, they're so closely combined and find they can't even raise a wing. Imagine if you're in a wonderful room, but after all, there's so many people, you, you can't move without jostling others. And of course, that would cause all kinds of problems. The chickens, uh, the egg laying hens, the natural instincts are so thwarted, they can't have the natural pecking order, so they end up pecking at each other, mm -hmm. which could harm them. So instead of giving them more space, they have a very terrible thing. They de beak them. Oh, my goodness. The whole process without anesthesia, without painkiller. And uh, very often it's such that it gets to the point where they can't eat, uh, and all many of them die, but. It's still, by crowding them together, they can still make more money even if some die in the process. So it's really super cruel, quite different from the powerful Jewish teachings I mentioned of Tzah Bar Chaim. And uh, this is why I think rabbis should be speaking out much, very strongly on that the fact that we now have such good much healthier substitute with the texture and taste very close to that of real animal products and that the animal-based diets and agriculture have the devastating effect, polluting the water, wasting the water, the grain, contributing to hunger, contributing to climate change. Uh, almost every environmental problem is worsened by animal-based diets. So, Thank you for this opportunity. And again, I hope it makes a difference. And Koa Kabo, Yashikoa, kudos to you and uh, best wishes to much success. It's great that you're having these programs. Hope you, I'm sure you will have many more very good programs and uh, keep up great work. Well, thank you so much, Prof. It's been such a pleasure to have you. And we've learned so much, and uh, we just wish you all the best for your upcoming book. So I just want to repeat it for our listeners out there. Uh, Vegan Revolution, Saving the World and Revitalizing Judaism. Prof, where can one obtain your book? Is it on Amazon? Or is it in the bookshop? It's on Amazon, and it's a U.S. publisher, so it's a little bit problem getting it to uh, Israeli bookstores. Hope it will. It's only been out a couple of weeks or so but certainly on Amazon. And uh, so I hope people will take advantage of that. And um, I, I'm trying, by the way, it's not just my book. I consider it's part of a cause, uh, you know, because I feel that uh, uh, the shift to vegan diets is both a societal imperative to avoid the climate catastrophe and a Jewish imperative because of the mandates I mentioned. Judaism has such splendid, splendid teachings, but of course, very important to put it into practice. And right now, the, the typical Jewish diet is violating basic, basic Jewish teaching to take care of our health, treat animals with compassion, and the other things I mentioned. So I hope. Uh, this will make a difference, and Lila Tov. Okay. So thank you so much. Wishing all our viewers out there a Chodesh Tov, and Prof, thank you so much. And we just hope that your book 
should become a bestseller. It deserves to, and it's highly recommended for everyone to go out there and to, to get a copy. And thank you so much for your very insightful and wonderful presentation that you gave. We really, we really want to thank you and we are gr extremely grateful to you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to be leaving now and uh, look forward to finding out once it's online and uh, being sent to YouTube. I'll let people know about it, of course. And again, wish you all much good health. Stay safe. Be very, very careful. Prop. And uh, in ending, could you show our viewers a, a copy of your book in, in ending? <laughs> okay, yeah, here oh, it is. Wonderful. <laughs> Didn't have time to talk about it, but you notice it's an iron, using the B as an iron. A lot of people recommend I shouldn't do that. You know, why are you thinking a puzzle thing? And for a while I was going to give it up, but it suddenly hit me, as you know, iron is not just a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, but it means the word I. And that's the purpose of my book get people to use their eyes to uh, see things from a different perspective, to see the kind of things I've been talking about. And there's a teaching, as you know, says, Ezehu Hacham Haro'er Et Hanolad. Yeah. The person who looks ahead and sees the future to a certain extent. So uh, I want to go into it, but I really try to explain there's much in that, that we have to have foresight, we have to see what is happening now, just one quick teaching. The word nega, which means a plague, and oneg have the same roots, ayin, nun, gimel. So what is the difference? The same letters, but a nega, a plague, a very terrible thing, has the ayin at the end of the word. So it's like doing something and then looking back and then saying, how in the world did I do that? The ayin's at the end. But the word oneg, which means like a joyous event, pleasurable event. The ayin is at the beginning of that word. So it's like we're using our eyes beforehand, foresight. So that is a different, same letters, but if you look afterwards, it can be very bad, look beforehand. There's other teachings, but that's in the preface where I try to explain why I use the ayin, because uh, again, we have to see foresee the consequences of our actions. And that is why we have this coronavirus today, uh, because people didn't see that in the past, there were many uh, other pandemics, all because of the horrible way we treat animals. And the group I'm working with, Jewish Best, by the way, just had a website, a pandemic free world, a lot of info on that. And people interested in seeing that can visit that website Pandemic free world. Okay, so all the best to everybody and uh, we'll be signing off. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, we can see you're very passionate about being a vegetarian and, uh, and your subject. And we really thank you. And we just wish, our, 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 and I, I'm speaking on behalf of the, the, the listeners and the viewers, we are extremely grateful to you. So thank you, Prof. And Kodesh Tov, and the Shana Tava, all the very best. All the best. Go to. Okay. Shalom.